words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. In C.S. Lewis's novel, Till We Have Faces, the main character, Orwell, loses the one person she loves most, her sister Psyche. The novel is Orwell's accusation against the gods. Her complaint is that the gods have dealt unjustly with her. Specifically, her complaint is that they have been silent and hidden at a time when she most needed them to make themselves known. Orwell is the daughter of a king, and she never marries. She's ugly. One of the first things Lewis tells us is that she's not just unattractive, she's very, very ugly. And her sister Psyche, by contrast, is stunningly beautiful. When the kingdom suffers drought and plague, the priests convince the king that the only way to appease the gods is to sacrifice Psyche. Out of fear, the king agrees, wanting to win the love of his people. Now the key event of the novel occurs right after the sacrifice of Psyche. Orwell travels to the mountain expecting to find Psyche's remains and to give her a proper burial. But instead, she finds Psyche healthy, happy, and strong. So naturally, this surprises Orwell. Orwell begs for a hint, a glimpse, anything that will help her solve the riddle of whether her sister has indeed found bliss with a god or is deceived. Orwell finds the riddle itself worthy of complaint. Why isn't she shown the truth clearly? The gods, she argues, if they, if they loved us, if they were good to us, would speak plainly. She begs for a sign and receives nothing, only silence. Or so she says. In fact, the gods have given her a glimpse of Psyche's palace. But Orwell's glimpse takes place in the dark, on a foggy night, when she's half asleep, on her knees, and drinking from the river of the god. And why give a sign under such conditions? Orwell's complaint, however, morphs at the end of her life. Her complaint changes to one of jealousy of the gods. At its core, her complaint once she sees who she is, once she has a face, in Lewis's words, her complaint is that the gods made Psyche happy, happier than Orwell had ever made her, and happy without Orwell. Orwell is jealous of the gods. Now, let me step back for a moment and offer a bit of framing for this talk. I first read this book when I was 20, and to be honest, I didn't love it. Um, I really didn't understand it, and I especially didn't understand this part of the book. Jealousy of God? Why would anyone be jealous of God? I trust Lewis on a lot of things, um, but this was beyond me. So this is the part of the book that I have most struggled to understand. And in fact, although I teach this text every semester in my Introduction to Philosophy course, 
Um, I generally shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know what's going on at this point, and move on to discuss some of the other rich themes. But several months ago, I lost a loved one, my sister. And I think I understand better now what Lewis is doing here. The day after my sister died, I was driving around Phoenix, Arizona, um, running funeral errands. I was cloudy-minded and overwhelmed with sadness. And there was uh, a beautiful sunset, as there often are in Phoenix. And as I looked up at the colorful sky, I thought, does she think it's beautiful? Does my sister think it's beautiful? Or is she looking at something so beautiful now that this no longer inspires her admiration? Now, it was just a thought, but it was a painful one. Before she died, when I imagined the pain of separation, I hadn't imagined this as part of it. It was enough that she was gone, and I can't talk with her now, um, that we wouldn't grow old together. But if she and I no longer share opinions about what's beautiful, this seemed to create uh, additional distance. Uh, we seem to be further apart now than I had imagined that we would be. As the weeks went on, I continued to wonder, what is she thinking? What is she seeing or doing? Uh, I read books on grief and the afterlife all the while realizing that the questions I was asking were not questions the answer to which we've been given. So much is hidden from our view. One morning a few weeks ago, I was having breakfast with some friends, um, and I realized that at its core, my questions were more like Orwell's complaint than I wanted to admit. At bottom, the core problem was that my sister is no longer with me. I believe she's happy, but there's an important sense in which I don't yet share in that happiness. She enjoys a bliss that I have not yet entered. Something of the hope we have for the future is revealed to her in a way that it's hidden from me now. Who she is in Christ now is hidden from me. We have glimpses of our future happiness, but much remains beyond our sight. And this contributes to the difficulty of grief. We don't know exactly what the intermediate period is like. We know and we trust that it is good, but there's a lot we don't see. Back to Orwell. Following her sister's death, Orwell changes. She wears a veil for the rest of her life. She hides herself. She casts aside her old identity as Orwell, the one who raised and loved Psyche, and takes on a new identity as queen. As queen, she both hardens and hides herself. She hides her emotions and literally her face from everyone. Her veil is a barrier to relationship with others. And in this way, she isolates herself. As she grieves, her grief tends towards despair. And she hides even her despair from others. Now, adopting a new identity is a natural response to the death of a loved one. Even if uh, it's not deliberate, the circumstances usher it in. We become fathers who have lost sons, mothers who have lost daughters, siblings who have lost sisters and brothers. Nor is the tendency to withdraw unusual. There's a strong temptation to hide. 
to hide both our tears and our grief. For Orwell, this takes on an unhealthy extreme. Of course, Orwell has no hope that she'll see Psyche again. And this is one key difference between Orwell and us. We grieve with hope, not despair. It was not until my sister died that I engaged in serious reflection about the afterlife. And to my disappointment, I realized we've been told very little. The way our lives are hidden in Christ, both now and after death, presents a kind of challenge in grief. And in the midst of my wondering, the affirmation of the goodness of creation came like water in a desert. So many times I've read those first few chapters of Genesis and thought, okay, creation is good, moving on. But in grief, this took on a new meaning. If God calls creation good, then surely it's not below my sister to think likewise and to find this world good and beautiful even while she is looking at the most good and the most beautiful. We've been told little, and yet we've been told something. And grief provides an opportunity to practice hope. Hope is a virtue, the object of which is a future good. Like faith, hope is of what is unseen. Hope is the expectation of future happiness, the resurrection of our bodies. And in this way, hope is future directed. In Romans 8, Paul says that the whole creation groans and awaits the coming redemption. Groaning is not a merely cognitive activity. It involves deep desire. We long for the resurrection. We don't merely believe that it will occur. How do we cultivate such a longing? In the death of a loved one, we're presented with an opportunity to open ourselves to grief and to allow the seed of our pain to grow into a longing for what is to occur and what is to come. When someone we love dies, this longing intensifies. Grief gives us something concrete to look towards. For me, seeing my sister again. The abstractness of new creation takes on a concrete form. And in our longing for the afterlife, we set our gaze further down the horizon. Not that we ignore or overlook the importance of this life, but we set our gaze on eternity. Now most of you, I imagine, are familiar with the um, already not yet slogan. It refers to the way in which our salvation is already accomplished. It is here and now, and yet there is more to come. We do not see or experience the full reality of it. And recently, there's been an emphasis on the here and the now, the already of salvation and kingdom life. While I agree that we ought to join with Christ in his redemptive work here and now, I think we need to be careful not to forget or underemphasize the not yet. And in times of grief, the not yet and the hope for it is especially important. What do I mean? I mean that we need to remember the ways in which the fullness of life, the fullness of the future life, is still to come. The life to come will be good in ways we do not experience here. There is a coming redemption of all things, a coming restoration, where we will not watch our loved ones die, and we, where we won't experience pain. 
where what we are and what our loved ones are in Christ will no longer be hidden. Here we see only partially, but there we will see fully. What is hidden will become seen. We are caught between creation and new creation, as N.T. Wright says. There is an incompleteness to our present experience. We have glimpses, but there is an incompleteness to our knowledge. The renewal and the resurrection that is to come is hidden from us. We trust that it will come. We hope for it, but we do not yet see it fully. So we wait. We wait with eager longing for the fullness of our salvation and for fullness of joy. For the day our loved ones will be unveiled in Christ. The resurrection is not simply the promise of eternal life beyond the grave, but it is that. And we cannot underemphasize that while we live in the here and the now. In this way, the loss of a loved one offers a corrective for our thinking by kindling in us a desire and a groaning for future redemption. So as always, there is a tension. Both sides must be held in balance. We simultaneously affirm the goodness of creation and long for the day of resurrection. And so, we have something that Orwell did not have, hope. Hope for new creation. And this can be an antidote to despair. Perhaps if Orwell had had hope, she would have responded to grief differently. Perhaps she would not have hidden herself so thoroughly that even she could not see what she had become until the end of her life when unveiled she no longer hides herself. It is then that her complaint dissolves as she makes it. So we grieve, but we do not grieve like pagans. We grieve with hope. We long and groan, but without despair. And we look to the man of sorrows for comfort, in whose presence we find fullness of joy. Thank you.